Welcome to the Alaska Weather Show. I'm meteorologist Peter Chant, coming to you from the National Weather Service on this Wednesday evening, January 26, 2022. And this is all on behalf of Alaska Public Media. We have a unique partnership with them that allows this program to reach you. And if you would like additional weather information, you can always go online, weather.gov. If you add forward slash Alaska, it'll focus in on Alaska. But nevertheless, when you come to the main page, you'll see the continental US with Alaska and Hawaii in the lower left. And all you have to do is click on the map and it will take you to that particular location. You can find out forecasts, whether or not there are any watches, warnings, advisories in effect, and much more. It's a good way to kind of uh, keep tabs on uh, the weather that's affecting family and friends in other parts of the country. Well, looking at our headlines, some more snow is going to be working its way up along the Gulf Coast, especially in the coastal mountains with rain at sea level. Uh, this is an association with a low pressure that's lifting out of the North Pacific up into the western half of the Gulf. The colder temperatures are going to re resume across the northern and western portions of the state, closer to a bit below normal. And uh, another thing in astronomy, we're I'll be watching an emerging uh, active sunspot uh, group that'll be rotating uh, facing the Earth here in the days ahead. Uh, new moon is on February 1st, so if we can get a decent uh, coronal mass ejection, perhaps we could get uh, some sort of uh, enhancement to the northern lights if you have clear skies. So keep your eyes peeled here over the weekend and especially into next week. But overall, it is looking like after a brief cool down uh, coming up here to close out the month in the first uh, couple few days of February, we could see temperatures increasing again across uh, the southwestern portion of the state, uh, the Alaska Peninsula on up into the southwest interior. And that uh, warmer, more moist air is once again a feed uh, southerly flow up into the central interior that will likely lead to uh, above normal precipitation, especially in the central interior, which could mean uh, more accumulating snows here in the, as we get into uh, the first, second week of February. Right now, uh, at least this afternoon, uh, looking out here, going further to the east, uh, Chitna, uh, we are looking at temperatures that have been in the 20s. There's going to be a little light snow and blowing snow developing there, winter weather advisory in effect, and then uh, talk. Uh, is going to be looking at light snow and blowing snow on the way as well as that moisture lifts northward from the Gulf. And further north and west, uh, no attack there north of Kotzebue was down to 36 below this morning. And temperatures across the northwest and especially the northern interior along the Brooks Range north slope will be uh, at times uh, 30s, a few spots even approaching 40 below. Further south and west, Kitnik, which is there uh, on the southwest coast, is going to become windy. The stronger offshore flow is going to force wind chills down uh, around 40 below at times later tonight and early on Thursday. That's just the back side of that uh, Gulf low. You get the uh, north-northeasterly winds. So looking at advisories, we have winter weather advisories for blowing snow up around Fort Yukon, Tanana, uh, Eagle, Northway, uh, Toke, and uh, down toward Glen Allen, you'll start to see, uh, south, especially south of Glen Allen, more in the way of accumulating snows. And as you get down toward Valdez, Thompson Pass, several inches of snow with blowing snow being a problem. The coastal mountains there uh, around uh, Cordova, Valdez, Whittier are going to pick up two, three feet of snow. Uh, even uh, Whittier will likely pick up uh, a good foot and a half of snowfall from this system. There is also a winter weather advisory for the Western Kenai, uh, including uh, the area Soldatna, especially for some blowing snow with this system. Even the Anchorage Bowl uh, between late this uh, Wednesday night through early Friday morning could pick up three to six inches of snow. So it's a longer duration event. Uh, the eastern hills of Anchorage could pick up a bit more than that. So just keep in mind, travel uh, across portions of South Central will be slowed down by the winter weather and then the wind chill advisory, including Bethel, Antioch, or not Antioch, but Bethel, down toward the coast as a result of those stronger northeast to north winds on the backside of the low later tonight, especially Thursday into Friday morning. Precipitation amounts uh, on Thursday, we can see that uh, this is the liquid equivalent that can go into making snow or if fall is rain is going to be highest from around Yakutat westward into Prince William Sound and uh, it will continue and kind of focus down along the length of the Panhandle by Friday where most of the precipitation, the inner channels and the outer coast there of the Panhandle will be seeing rain. 
because the freezing levels there are going to be at least 2,000 feet or a bit higher. So near sea level uh, precipitation will be primarily there, rain. And uh, we also do expect some lighter snow to get up uh, there into uh, the southeast interior along the Elkan border and along and especially south of the Alaska range with this system. So the satellite imagery, you can see the white, uh, brighter cloud tops at the leading edge of the cirrus clouds lifting northward with then the comma or the kind of circular shape to the low center there that's way south of Kodiak toward the center bottom of your screen. That is that low that is lifting uh, to the north, northeast. We also have a uh, couple of systems out uh, south and southwest of the central and western Aleutians and uh, that's also going to bring uh, in some gustier winds across the central Aleutians by Friday. But the main weather player is going to be the low that's going to be working its way up through the western into the northern gulf as we go by into Friday. High pressure will remain across eastern Russia uh, into uh, oh the Brooks Range north slope into uh, far northern Canada and that feature will just kind of hold. That's going to also tend to enhance the pressure gradient over uh, the western Alaska range and southwest interior and southwest coast as we go into uh, later tonight and especially by Thursday. You can see overnight early Thursday morning uh, we have a couple of a uh, few high centers there from eastern Russia into uh, northern Canada with the low there still south of Kodiak Island and then by Thursday afternoon the low will start to lift slowly northward with the occluded front extending up into the western and northern gulf and along that boundary we expect snow in the warmer air uh, out along the coast it'll be in the form of rain another low takes shape up there into the central Aleutians the one by Friday though is going to be a little more wrapped up there so there could be some uh, uh, more turbulence and gustier winds there in through the uh, central Aleutians with that particular system as the snows continue to fall there especially uh, the lower southern Copper River Basin into the mountains around Prince William Sound and uh, rain likely continuing there, especially across the inner channels and uh, outer coast of the Panhandle. Lows Thursday morning will generally be near or just above freezing. Uh, there was the dense fog earlier today this morning, but a little break in the action this Thursday is going to give way, I should say Wednesday, is going to give way to increasing thickening cloud cover with more precipitation overspreading uh, the Panhandle by Thursday uh, evening. And we do get temperatures in the lower 40s there in the uh, outer coastal areas there, especially in the south and west. Temperatures uh, will be in the 20s at, uh, say, Telkeetna, Anchorage, down through Kenai, and uh, generally above freezing along the Gulf Coast. Lows not as cold Friday morning uh, in south central areas, just inland. And then Friday afternoon, temperatures should generally be back up in the 20s there at uh, Oh, say Valdez and Anchorage. A little colder though on the west side of the Alaska range. And looking at the north, coldest temperatures are going to be along and north of the Yukon River. Morning lows Thursday morning. Some areas will be in the 30s to possibly even near 40 below in a couple of spots. But otherwise, much uh, colder than it has been. And we'll see daytime highs remain below freezing all through the Yukon Valley and especially along uh, the Brooks Range and North Slope and the Arctic Coast. And Friday morning, a repeat with lows in the 20s and 30s below, very common with uh, daytime highs Friday afternoon moderating a little bit to generally uh, single digits and teens below zero. So maybe not quite as cold as what we have coming up here in the next day or so. Southwest interior morning lows are going to be uh, well below zero, especially as you go up the uh, Yukon River uh, as you get up toward uh, Galena. Otherwise, temperatures should be at or above freezing from the eastern Aleutians uh, westward. And then uh, daytime highs Thursday afternoon, still a bit sub-zero there as you get up the uh, Yukon and Kuskokwim River basins. Temperatures will get up uh, to around or just above freezing starting at the tip of the Alaska Peninsula. And for Friday morning, uh, look for lows uh, below zero across the southwest interior, 10, 15 below, quite common. Uh, lows uh, will be below freezing even down into the eastern Aleutians with highs Friday afternoon. Uh, only around freezing in the eastern Aleutians, but uh, generally near zero there across much of the southwest interior. So we're just seeing a brief uh, cool down closer to near normal to a bit below normal temperatures with the focus of that being in the northern part of the state. And that'll be the trend at least uh, to start off the beginning of February, the coldest temperatures in the north. A little moderating temperatures a bit above normal there, especially in the southwest across the Alaska Peninsula, even the uh, Panhandle seeing temperatures uh, slightly above normal. 
but as we go further in time, it's looking like uh, the warmth could build again on, over the southwest interior as well as the Alaska Peninsula. And when that happens, that means we're getting more of a south-southwest flow off the Gulf of Alaska and as well as the North Pacific. So that's going to have a tendency to increase the chances of above normal precipitation across the interior, especially along and south of the Yukon River through the Alaska Range. So stay tuned to later forecast. And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Well, it's now time for your aviation forecast. And if you are planning a flight Thursday into Friday to close out this week, the main weather players will be an area of low pressure lifting out of the North Pacific up through the Western Gulf. It'll be located just off the Kenai and northeast of Kodiak by Friday. And this is gonna cause widespread IFR conditions across uh, the Gulf Coast. Meanwhile, along the north, uh, high pressure will rule from uh, eastern Russia across the North Slope and Brooks Range into the uh, Canadian Arctic coast. And we'll be also watching a couple of low pressure systems rotate on up through the central western Aleutians and that'll tend to bring some windier conditions, especially by Friday that could lead to some uh, enhanced turbulence. Uh, looking at IFR conditions, look for them to uh, increase across the Gulf and up into uh, the southeast interior Thursday morning and uh, further expanding northward along up to about the Yukon River along the Elkan border, as well as uh, in through uh, uh, the northern two thirds or so of the Panhandle by Thursday afternoon. We expect IFR conditions to be more widespread along the inner channels and intercoastal mountains of the Panhandle by Friday morning, extending up uh, through about the Yukon River there along the Alcan border and much of the Alaska Range down through Prince William Sound back toward uh, the east side of Kodiak Island. And for Friday afternoon, widespread IFR conditions are anticipated throughout the Panhandle and especially along the Gulf Coast. Uh, looking at uh, past conditions if you are planning a flight Anatovic as well as Adigan passes. We'll see generally MVFR conditions on Thursday though. The further south you fly, especially both south entrances of Adigan and Anatovic will tend to be um, VFR. And then uh, further south and west, Lake Clark and Merrill will generally see MVFR conditions during the day on Thursday. And as we uh, round the Alaska range, Rainy Pass will see VFR in the morning become MVFR and a little further towards central areas of uh, the Alaska range, we'll see Windy Pass become IFR, uh, certainly by afternoon as moisture from that Gulf system uh, spreads a little further north and pulls back a little to the west. Further east along the Alaska range, Isabel, as well as Mentasta Pass will be socked in with IFR conditions because of that moisture feed that's uh, streaming northward. And then Tanita Pass, as we go down through the Copper River ba Basin and, and all the way down to Tanita Pass, IFR conditions are anticipated. Portage Pass should generally stay IFR, especially east entrance and out over Prince William Sound as you go along the Gulf. And then further uh, southeastward into the northern end of the Panhandle, Chilkoot and White will see IFR conditions on Thursday with more widespread IFR conditions anticipated throughout uh, the Panhandle as we go through uh, later Thursday and into Friday. Freezing levels do come out, out ahead of that low over the eastern Gulf, uh, 2,000 feet there along the north central Gulf Coast, rising up to 6,000 feet there. The outer southwestern portions of the Panhandle, including Sitka down toward Craig, and as high as 8,000 feet over Haida Gwaii. The surface freezing line runs along the outer uh, Panhandle coast to uh, down along uh, eastern Kodiak Island, and then cutting back across uh, the eastern Aleutians out into the central and far western uh, Bering Sea. The greatest threat for icing is associated with a deeper moisture that will be working its way northward through the Gulf on Thursday. Between 5,000 and 17,000 feet, there could be some considerable moderate areas of icing along the Gulf Coast. Further inland with that moisture feed between 2 and 12,000 feet as you go along and north of the Alaska Range along the Alcan border, including uh, especially northern Copper River Basin. Uh, jet stream winds are strongest uh, along uh, portions of Canada, northern, far northern Canada, in excess of 100 knots. We do see southwest winds upwards of 80 to 95 knots coming in over the uh, panhandle into Haida Gwaii. And on the backside, uh, winds to 90 knots over the western Seward Peninsula and Bering Strait. At mid-levels, 9,000 foot winds are anywhere from around 45 to 60 knots over the panhandle into Haida Gwaii and British Columbia. 
and then on the back side of the low circulation we see north northeast winds over the y k deltas to sixty knots and coming down to three thousand feet we see along coastal areas of the gulf the northern gulf winds upwards to sixty knots that will lend toward turbulence and then also we see on the west side of the alaska range sixty five knot winds at three thousand feet this will translate to isolated severe turbulence west of the alaska range over the southwest coast uh, as we go through Thursday with a broad area of considerable moderate turbulence along the Gulf Coast into the Aleutians. Welcome back to another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, joined once again by the science liaison of GINA, Eric Stevens. GINA, of course, is the Geographic Information Network of Alaska based up at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. And GINA is all about satellites, and Eric mm -hmm. is always here to tell some really cool stuff about satellites. Now, the last time you were here, we talked about how the weather satellites can see clouds and what's under the clouds, but you're telling me that satellites can do a lot more, even protect the, uh, the general public uh, with uh, aviation safety information. That's right. There's one particular aspect of satellites we're going to mm -hmm. talk about today that might not be immediately obvious, and that is detecting things in the atmosphere mm -hmm. that are not clouds, that are not snow, not rain, huh. but rather a hazard that can happen here in Alaska, and that is volcanic ash. Uh, of course. When okay. a volcano goes off, puts ash in the air, this is of course a hazard to the public if the ash were to fall on the ground in, in accumulating amounts. Sure. Additionally, while the ash is in the air, and this is the more frequent hazard, is it's a hazard to aviation mm -hmm. because you cannot fly an airplane into volcanic ash without, without great risk. Worst case scenario, the ash gets into a jet engine, right. wrecks the engine, kills the engine, mm -hmm. and now you have an airplane flying with no engines. Right. It won't fly for long. So aviators need to avoid that ash how do you avoid the ash? You have to know where it is mm -hmm. by identifying it with a satellite image and perhaps predicting then where the ash will flow with the overall weather patterns. Satellites are so important for identifying when a volcano goes off mm -hmm. and then tracking the ash after the, the volcano injects the ash into the atmosphere. Now, are you talking about seeing the heat signature or a huge volcanic plume with a cloud that we're used to seeing in the really pretty pictures of, of any Alaska volcano that's erupted recently, Redoubt, for example? Or are mm -hmm. we talking about the really fine details? Because this well, is polar orbiting satellites, the ones that are very low to the ground, right? Mm -hmm. The, the geostationary satellites can do some detection. The polar orbiters, like you say, they're mm -hmm. closer to the Earth. They mm -hmm. give the even better view. In answer to your question, mm -hmm. I would say all of the above. Oh, okay. A cool. heat signature from a volcano going off with all the, the heat that comes um, with the eruption, that mm -hmm. can be identified in infrared imagery. Okay. We've got images from the Kamchatka Peninsula. That's, that's the far eastern part of Russia mm -hmm. on the western side of the Bering Sea, loaded with volcanoes. Right. You know, Alaska has plenty of volcanoes of its own. We can also be affected when a, a volcano goes off in Kamchatka, say, mm -hmm. and then the weather carries that ash toward Alaska from the west. Right. You can see the, the infrared heat signature, like you say. Okay. Also, um, the ash in the air can be detected by doing some sophisticated uh, channel differencing within the satellite data. You can find the, uh, the identification of sulfur dioxide, say, that's a component of the volcanic okay. emission, mm -hmm. and you can trace this um, with the satellite imagery. Um, sometimes volcanoes go off that haven't gone off before, mm -hmm. and we're not expecting them to go off. Say if there's no seismometers around a given volcano that hasn't gone off in 100 years, you might not be expecting it to go off in the satellite imagery. Since satellites can be right. globally comprehensive, that might be the first sign that you have that a volcano oh, wow. in an unexpected area is going off. So it's a good backup system, okay. Right, wow. right, and, and people are working all the time on automating the, uh, the interrogation of satellite data by computers mm -hmm. to provide a, a first alert to a human to, so the software will say, we think this might be important human, go take a closer look, because right. the people are still the best way to, to interrogate the imagery, but the planet's a big place, yes. and we can't be looking everywhere all the time, so the software helps give a first, first cut. And then in Alaska, there's a special kind of surprise angle where the satellites are helpful, and that is um, the Katmai eruption mm -hmm. of 1912. Um, huge eruption. There is still somewhat of a moonscape out there in southwest right. Alaska where all this ash is laying on the ground. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a, a strong weather pattern comes along where we have roaring northwest winds that go across the Alaska Peninsula there and 
can actually pick some of this ash up right. off the ground. No volcano is going off. This was more than 100 years ago that that volcano actually yeah. blew. So you're not going to see a heat signature like we were discussing. Mm -hmm. uh, there will be no seismic signature of a volcano going off. So those data sets, they'll say, oh, no right. problem. Mm -hmm. But you can see in some of the satellite imagery this ash, as it's called, resuspended. Right. When the, the wind comes along, picks it up, the ash can be lofted a few thousand feet in the air just okay. with the wind. And an airplane flying into that plume is, is exposed to some danger. So we need to track right. that ash to provide guidance to aviators that you don't want to be flying here at these elevations in this area. We've got some imagery of the resuspension. And you can mm -hmm. see the wind blowing strongly from the northwest, picking up the ash and, and blowing it down to the southeast. Right. And so that's another perhaps not immediately obvious hazard of volcanic ash. It, Katmai is the gift that keeps on giving <laughs> for sure. Very good. So we've got satellites that, that can help us understand the weather uh, from the past and the immediate past. And we talked last time about how that's feeding into the forecast modeling to help improve mm -hmm. predictions. But mm -hmm. now they're also protecting the general public with aviation sensitive information and watching volcanoes, whether they're erupting or maybe have erupted in the past and finding the, the left behinds from, from those uh, volcanic events there. So really impressive stuff. Mm -hmm. Eric, thanks so much for joining us again today. And uh, you're a gift that keeps on giving from the satellite community. <laughs> so thanks a lot. And we hope to have you back again soon. Again, Eric Stevens with Gina at the University of Alaska. Fairbanks. And if you'd like to check out any of the information that uh, Eric has shared with us again today, you can do that very easily by going to www.gina.alaska.edu. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder, and thanks for joining us for another edition of Alaska Weather Facts. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back, and we conclude today's show, as we always do, with the marine weather segment, including the sea ice edge. And only thing to note is what we've been saying for some time now, again, with uh, low pressure working its way up through the western gulf uh, through Friday. That means on the backside of the low, we're going to see uh, winds with northerly components uh, running down there along the eastern Bering from the Bering Strait along the southwest coast, so the ice will continue to push in advance south and a bit westward here the next couple of days to close out the week. And temperatures will be a bit colder, especially around Norton Sound and up through the Bering Strait and along the Arctic coast. That's where the coldest air will reside over the northern and western portions of the state. So the marine forecast though for the uh, Panhandle, as that low works its way in the Gulf, look for the inner channels to have winds from the southeast and uh, south at about 15 to 25 knots, waves uh, generally running around at four feet. Along the outer coast, winds will be out of the west, southwest, 15 knots, waves 10 to 12 feet. For Friday's marine forecast, though, we are going to see uh, things whereby we expect winds to be increasing from the uh, south, southeast, with gusts as high as 35 to 40 knots across the uh, inner channels there in the southern central areas. And along the outer Gulf Coast, uh, we could see winds around from the south uh, at 30, 35 knots, turning more southeasterly from Yakutat westward with waves over the Gulf there, uh, running generally around 12 to 16 feet. On Thursday, winds will be uh, across south central areas increasing out of the uh, north northeast. Northeasterly in Prince William Sound, uh, 25 knots, six foot waves off the Kenai, 35. 35 knot winds with waves around 10 feet. And then uh, south of Anchor Point uh, there in the Cook Inlet, we're looking at north winds at 40 knots uh, with waves 12 to 16 feet at the mouth of Cook Inlet. Winds will come down a bit on Friday, generally across the region around 20 to 30 knots, though a little stronger there through lower Cook Inlet out of the northeast and northwest, respectively at uh, 30 to 35 knots and waves around eight to 10 feet. Uh, waves across Prince William Sound will continue to be around six feet with northeasterly winds. Strongest winds, Kodiak Island there, Shelikoff Strait, 45 knot gales out of the northeast. Uh, and down along uh, the Alaska Peninsula, Pacific side, 30 to 35 knot winds from the northeast and north. And generally north to northeast winds, 30 knots on the Bering side with waves as high as eight feet north of Cold Bay. For Friday, Winds turn more westerly across Kodiak Island, 20 to 25 knots, and then northwesterly off 
the Alaska Peninsula and the North Pacific 30 knots uh, with waves around 10 feet and north winds uh, 20 to 30 knots there from Bristol Bay down toward Cold Bay. The eastern Aleutians will see northeast to east winds around 25 to near 30 knots, even extending out to the central Aleutians. Waves uh, 10 to 15 feet eastern Aleutians, but uh, getting upwards around 15 to even 20 feet south of Adak and Atka, with southeasterly winds upwards to 45 knots west of Kiska and waves over 20 feet. For Friday, uh, a little compact low is going to be uh, just uh, southwest of the central Aleutians. So that's going to introduce some stronger winds to 40 knots there out of the east and waves building to around 20 feet, uh, especially south of Adak as well as west of Adak between there and Kiska. Lighter winds out of the east northeast around 25 knots over the eastern Aleutians with waves 8 to 12 feet. Across the west coast, Look for a northerly component to the wind that's going to cause the ice to want to push further south and a bit westward. Uh, strongest winds uh, along the ice edge around 30 knots uh, out of the uh, north northeast. St. Paul, St. George could see some nine foot waves. And then for Friday, winds continue, maybe not quite as strong out over the ice to 20 knots out of the northwest from Norton Sound south of. Uh, St. Lawrence to Nunavik Island turning more northeasterly 25 to 30 knots and again waves around 8-9 feet there as you get west of St. Matthew and certainly in the vicinity of St. Paul and St. George. Waves, uh, uh, winds along the Arctic coast 20 knots from the west turning more southerly through the lower Chukchi Sea 5 to 15 knots and then for Friday we expect winds to be out of the uh, west southwest 25 knots along the Arctic coast. Uh, turning uh, back toward uh, the north 15 to 20 knots through the Bering Strait. So that does it for your marine weather. And once again, thank you for joining us on this Wednesday evening. Be sure to join me again tomorrow night. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating. <laughs>